You're listening to the In Focus Interview Show, brought to you by Photofocus.com, an online publication filled with education and inspiration for visual storytellers. This episode is made possible by our partners Loom Cube, the world's most versatile light, and Drobo, a smart storage solution. Now, here's your host, Vanelli. Hello and welcome. I'm Vanelli. Now, my guest is an internationally renowned commercial people and children f- photographer based in his beloved New York City. His creative problem solving and helped promote products and services for many companies such as Toys R Us, the Wall Street, Kodak, and many more. He's had several Time Magazine covers. Please welcome Jack Rosnicki. Hello, Jack. Hi, hi, Vanelli. How you doing? I'm, I'm glad you mentioned companies that I work for that I now drove out of business, like Kodak and Toys R Us. <laughs> well, I got a bunch of those. <laughs> anyway, well, how are you today? Yeah, great. It was funny, Jack, because I've always known you as one of the top portrait photographers. You know, that you've mastered light, and that's one thing I've always learned from you over the years is how you light your subjects, um, and then. You know, as we got to know each other more and more over these years, you teamed up with the talented litigator at Greenberg, uh, and together yeah. you guys created the copyright zone. Yeah, we've we've lectured and talked for for many years. Ed, I've known for I, I don't want to almost say how many years. I think it's been close to thirty five years now, and um, uh, long before we started doing this. Um, in, in fact, we uh, up until um, uh, this quarantine, we've had a weekly poker game that we've had with a group of guys. <laughs> um, you know, think the odd couple. I mean, it's it's quite a, yeah. <laughs> a, char- a bunch, quite a bunch of uh, characters, but we play every week. But Ed, um, I got involved uh, teaching and talking about copyright. I've, I've always been conscious of my copyright. I've always played close attention to it. Um, and then years ago, I had Canon ask me to go around um, and give some talks on it. And that's just uh, ballooned from there. Um, not only have, have I uh, done, I don't want to think how many lectures on it, um, and I teach it at uh, a graduate level class at the School of Visual Arts, um, but I've also been an expert witness in federal court uh, in a copyright case, not with Ed Greenberg, but with uh, somebody else in, in one very major case. And uh, Ed and I have produced two textbooks on copyright uh, called, uh, the second one the, uh, is called The Copyright Zone. But we, we have to update that because the uh, uh, Copyright Office has changed the steps on how you register your images. So we have to update that section of our book. But, uh, it is so funny. So when you first started talking about copyright, I loved what you said the, re- the very first time. Look, you wouldn't go up to another photographer and say, hey, check out my tooth. Do, do I have a cavity <laughs> here? Um, well, they're not a dentist. So why are you asking them law questions? Ask a lawyer. And oh. I've always I've always thought that was um, hitting the nail, <coughs> hitting the nail right on the head. Because um, you're yeah. right. Photographers have a tendency of trying to go the easy way out and, you know, trying to get questions answered by other photographers that don't have a clue. Yeah. So, it's a, a herd mentality thinking that somebody who's another photographer would know. And they don't. Uh, I, the worst, the worst possible thing to do if you've been infringed is go on social media and say, Oh, this is the problem I have. Um, and ask for advice. And I'll tell you 90% or more of the advice I see is terrible. The first mm-hmm. thing most of the people will tell you to do is send an invoice to the person who infringed. And that's like the worst thing to do. We tell people, no, 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 do not send an invoice. Not for two times, four times, 10 times, whatever you think. It, it's going to bite you in the rear later on. Um, and you don't realize it. You have no clue as to what you're looking at. You don't know if you're looking at one infringement, or you're just seeing the tip of an iceberg of a lot of infringements. And then if you send in a bill for, let's say, oh, uh, I normally charge a thousand, I'm going to charge them $2,500 for this. And you send in a bill. Um, And then you find out you go to a lawyer and a lawyer tells you, oh, this is worth uh, maybe $40,000, $50,000, this type of a case. And um, uh, 
you go, you know, great. And you, you go to court and the other side brings in your invoice and the judge is going to ask you, well, if you're, um, if you were happy sending them an invoice for $2,500, why are you suing for 40 or 50,000? That's, that's one of the problems you can face with this. So, and again, social media is like the worst and, and the absolute worst is to actually mention the client you're having a problem with. Uh, Cause I, I'll tell you, every client has something called uh, Google alerts on their name. I have it on my name. If, if you don't know what Google alerts is, look it up and do a Google alert on your name. When somebody mentions me in um, uh, on their website or something that they went to one of my sites, I usually see that. It comes up on Google Alerts. Now, if you're having a problem with a company, I'll bet you somebody in the company has your name on Google Alerts and uh, definitely their name. So if you mention something, they're going to see it. And I, I saw one guy once had something that said basically, oh, you know, I, I'm going for a reuse with this client of mine, uh, uh, XYZ Shoes. And, um, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to charge them 2X, um, but I'd really like to charge them 3X because I really, really need the money. I'm really, really tight right now. Hmm. Well, guess what? They heard that and they said, tell you what, we'll give you half X. Um you know, it, it's it, you don't discuss certain things on social media, and definitely not uh, looking for legal advice from photographers. It just doesn't make sense. Wow! Just in that short two or three minutes, you gave us a wealth of information. Um, that's why I always love talking to you. Now, uh, so our our topic is what? <coughs> Excuse me. Is why is it important to register your work? And like you said, if you're infringed. Why is it important to choose a reputable litigator? Let's tackle the first part. Why is it important to register your work? Well, there's there's a couple reasons. Um, uh, the first one, and the most important one, is the ability to file a lawsuit. You cannot file a copyright infringement lawsuit without the registration in hand. In fact, the Supreme Court just ruled this past summer, uh, this past summer, uh, boy, that's a, that's a year ago already, sorry. Uh, they just ruled uh, um, months ago that you have to have the registration in hand um, because some of the circuits were saying uh, you could apply for the registration and that was enough to start a lawsuit, um, uh, like one or two of the circuits. And to, to settle all of this, the Supreme Court took up one of the cases and they said, no, you can't just apply for a registration. You have to have the registration in your hand uh, to file a lawsuit. And you can only file a copyright infringement lawsuit, any copyright lawsuit, in federal court, which makes it very serious. You're not going to civil court. Federal court is very, very serious. The way they run it and the rules that, that they have are very different um, than just a civil court and, and what needs to be produced. So the number one thing is the lawsuit. If the other side hires a lawyer and they're smart, um, if they don't see a registration, they basically ignore you because there is nothing you can do. So that's the most important reason as to why to register your work at the Copyright Office. Now, um, there are other advantages. Um, if you register before the infringement, and that's important. We always want to try and register before the infringement. You can register after an infringement if you haven't registered, but it limits what you can get in damages. Um, the two types of damages are uh, compensatory damages and statutory damages. Compensatory is, is um, actual damages. So uh, the court's going to look and saying, okay, show us what you normally license this image for. And if you normally license for uh, $500 or $1,000, you're not going to get $30,000, $50,000. You're going to get actual damages. Now, statutory damages you can get if you're registered before the infringement. And that can go up to $150,000. It starts at about $30,000 or $35,000. Um, uh, in, in most cases. And if you can prove um, um, willful infringement, then it can go up to $150,000 per infringement. You might find, and, and this happened in the one case I was involved in, 
um, there were multiple infringements of the image. They used it over and over again in different ways. And the damages came up to a couple million dollars uh, in that case. That doesn't always happen, but that is a possibility. Um, so that's one of the advantages of, of registering before the infringement. The other thing is if you register before the infringement, you can recover the law, your lawyer fees. That usually scares the other side quite a bit. If they know this is a registered image before the infringement, that you're entitled to all of this, um, uh, that usually, uh, and, and by the way, I, I'd say over 90% of the cases are settled. Uh, very, very few actually go to trial in court. Um, I, I've been hearing these things um, online from even trade associations trying to scare people that it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to pursue a copyright infringement lawsuit. No, it doesn't. I've done it. it it's um, the the filing fee itself in federal court is four or five hundred dollars. Um, you know, it. it it's and like I said, once you start filing a case, um, then many times you know you're getting a settlement. A lot of the lawyers just talk to each other. If you get a competent lawyer, which which I want to talk more about, but let me skip ahead and also saying um, the other things you get from registration is uh, you can get an injunction. So if it's being used. Uh, in a book, on a t-shirt, um, if it's being used in commerce, you can get an injunction that tells them you want it off the shelves, you want it out of trade. Um, and again, an injunction uh, usually doesn't uh, f get them to take it out of commerce. Usually it just means you're going to get more in a settlement because they're going to have to settle quickly. Um, the last thing, and, and I'm not going to go into, is um, if you've been registered for, uh, I forget if it's two or three years, it's considered prima facie evidence. Uh, and what that means is it's considered on its face that this is your copyright and this is your image. You don't have to prove that it's your image. It's, it's accepted in court that, that you own this image and you own the copyright. Um, but those are the things that are spelled out as to why you register. And you register at the Copyright Office, which you can go to if you go to copyright.gov. Not copyright.com, that's a commercial site. You go to copyright.gov and you continue to register your images. Now, they changed it since February 2019 that you can only register 750 images on one application, and that's $55. So for $55, you can register 750 images. Before that, you could register 10,000 images for the $55, but now it's 750. And if if you think that's limiting, and I think it is, and, and I'd love to see them change it, if you're an illustrator or an artist, if you produce paintings or illustrations, you can only register 10 of those for the $55. So we, we are getting a bit of a bargain. Um, and I've been reg regularly registering my images. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's really image insurance. And that's the way you have to think about it. You know, people have camera insurance. You drop your camera, you can replace your camera. If your image gets ripped off, the only insurance you have, the only the only protection you have is copyright registration here in the United States. Um, it has to be registered in order to file the lawsuit. I can't repeat that enough. There's no workaround on that. Photographers are always saying, well, what about, and oh, this company said they'll do this. No. And, and don't trust any other company to register for you. We've seen many, many problems with that. And other people are saying, well, blockchain. No, that is not a protection. Um, the only protection, and I can't emphasize it enough, is registering your copyright at the copyright office. Jack, you're, you're going to cringe when I tell you this. Um, I was teaching a class and we came up with copyright and, we're, and I was giving a little lecture on, you know, back then it was the um, Library of Congress, right? Is we mm -hmm. sent it to? And so well, I it, mentioned it's, it. It's, and, it still is. The Copyright Office yes. is part of the Library of Congress. Good. Um, and so I made a comment in this, one of the students, and this is college level, with a straight face, said, oh, no, our teacher told us all we need to do 
is put the uh, I, I know you. this. I, I know what's coming yep. up. Yeah, go ahead. Put, put it in an envelope <laughs> and send send myself the um the image in in the mail and don't ever open up that that um the mail. And I laughed. I said, Oh my god, is it is that joke still going around? That was a joke back when I was a little kid. And he gave me the serious look. Oh no, that's serious. And I wow. Um so yeah, the answer to the in, answer yeah, the, the answer to that is your your instructor's an idiot. Um what the only thing that proves in court is that you mailed yourself something. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's it's an it's a it's an urban myth that has not died. Um, I, I had somebody in one of my lectures say that their lawyer told them to do that, and I said your lawyer's an idiot. Um, it, it there is absolutely no protection in that, and and we say that this blockchain um, where people are saying, well, well, you know, that'll be a registration of your image. It's it's the same thing as mailing yourself um, uh, the image through the mail. It, it proves nothing. And, and that thing was done because they said, oh, it's when, when the post office was part of the federal government and, and not, you know, uh, uh, weaned out, um, people thought because it went through the federal mail that there was some kind of protection. No, that, that just proves that you mailed yourself something. Got it. Now, now, Jack, you often said there is a difference between an attorney and a, lit a litigator. Um, can you explain the difference and why it's important to choose a reputable litigator? But before we do that, let's just take a moment and thank our partners. Loom Cube. Loom Cube is proudly known as the world's most versatile light. It's the smallest, lightest, most compact professional lighting solution on the market. Loom Cube represents the future of LED lighting and is a must have for anyone looking to create better photos and video. Check out the new Loom Cube strobe, offering anti collision lighting for drones at loomcube.com. Drobo. Drobo is a smart storage solution that protects photos, videos, and more from hard drive failure, giving peace of mind for the working pro or serious amateur who have a lot of external drives cluttering up their desktop. Save 10% at drobostore.com with the coupon code PHOTOFOCUS. And we're back with internationally renowned commercial people and children photographer, Jack Rosnicki. Now, Jack, the question before the break was, can you explain the difference between an attorney and a litigator and why it's important to choose, <coughs> excuse me, to choose a reputable litigator? No, I can't answer that. <laughs> no, 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 I can. I will. I will. Um, it, it's, and this goes not just for copyright cases. This, this also goes for things like personal injury or other things. You want to know if, if the lawyer you're talking to um, is a litigator um, because uh, litigators are the ones that go into court. Uh, there's a lot of lawyers who never go to court. They're not litigators. And so if, if you have a personal injury case and you actually get a, you know, a lawyer who, who we call a door lawyer, door lawyer is, is they'll take any case that comes through the door, um, but they don't litigate. Uh, and we know one, uh, I know one personal injury lawyer, she specializes in litigating for other lawyers because what happens is you, you give all the information to, you know, your lawyer, he goes over it and then he'll tell you, by the way, we have to bring in a specialist for this because your case, you know, is going to require this uh, in court. What he's not telling you is I can't go into court. I, I don't know the procedures. I, I, you have to be a litigator to do that. So uh, that's real important. And, and we emphasize it's important to do research. In fact, um, Ed Greenberg and I have a blog where we have a lot of uh, information. It, it's, we, we run it irregularly. So whenever we have a topic or we can do it, sometimes we might have um, uh, one a week. Sometimes we might have one every two or three months. Uh, the last uh, blog piece we put up was talking about um, hiring lawyers and, and being careful to get um, good recommendations because there are some lawyers out there um, who are litigators who are terrible. There, there's one in particular out there right now who claims that he um, um, 
puts in um, uh, files more copyright cases than any other law firm. And it's true. And the courts are sanctioning him because he doesn't know what he's doing. They're saying there's no way you can adequately litigate or represent that many clients. Um, and yeah, and it's hilarious. Right? I mean, that's dangerous. Yeah, well, yeah, what what it's it's a long story of of what this one particular lawyer is doing. If if you copyright um uh, a copyright uh, a copyright troll lawyer, his name will come up. It'll be very obvious. But you should do that for any lawyer you're hiring. You you want to find somebody local to you, um, and e even Ed Greenberg. Some people saying, well, Ed's trying to get work. Ed t tells everybody. He, he says, where are you located? You know, it's, uh, San Francisco. I, I can give you a recommendation, but you need to get somebody in, in California. Um, uh, and he does that a lot. You, you need to have a local lawyer at all possible. And you need to have a lawyer who's an intellectual property lawyer, an IP lawyer. Um, you, you don't, you know, it's, you don't look for a mechanic, um, um, you know, for your airplane under mechanic, you know, gotcha. it's, you know, he, maybe he can fix your Volvo or, you know, your Toyota, uh, doesn't mean he can fix your plane. They're both mechanics. Um, uh, the, the one I like, cause this actually happened to us with somebody who once at a, at a breakfast somewhere with, with somebody we just met, her new boyfriend said he was a conductor. And immediately we were, we were impressed thinking, <laughs> wow, you know, a conductor in front of an orchestra. And then he finished the, the rest of the sentence on the Long Island Railroad. <laughs> well, yeah, he's a conductor and the other one's a conductor too. It's the same thing with lawyers. You need to do research and, um, we recommend that's something you can ask online about with other photographers. Have, have you, have you had somebody you're happy with? Have you been successful, um, um, pursuing an infringement case with, uh, a lawyer? Uh, you know, that type of thing is fine. Don't discuss what your case is or how you've been infringed, but asking for that kind of help from the community on social media is not a bad thing to do. And if you can't get a good recommendation, near where you are. The other thing we recommend, which we think is a great suggestion, is uh, find your, a local law school near you and give them a call, ask for who teaches uh, intellectual property, and ask that instructor who he would recommend. Um, we find that's better than calling the local bar association. The problem with calling a local bar association, they might give you somebody um, who may not have a lot of experience, but needs the work, you know, they're going to try and bring it over to somebody who uh, actually needs it. But um, we do talk in our column too, that at this point, because of what's going on with the quarantine and, and uh, digital, we think it's only affected photographers, but it's heavily affected the law industry where a lot of young lawyers out of law school, um, uh, you know, the work that they used to do by hand are now being do, done by computers. Uh, and digitally, uh, looking up cases and things. There's a lot of lawyers looking for work, and you have to be careful. There's some really, really good lawyers who give you really good advice, and there's some really bad lawyers out there, which we all know. I mean, you know, what's okay, so so, Jack? With that, what in some of the cases you've heard, well, what's <clears throat> are the worst case scenario? Let's say I, I get a bad litigator. He goes in, and and I have an airtight. Everyone knows this is my image. What mm -hmm. could go wrong? He doesn't file correctly. Um, this litigator I'm talking about just had um, uh, a few days ago. The court said this was a, a decent in Illinois, uh, federal court in Illinois, and they said uh, he just didn't follow procedures. He didn't follow federal procedures. He didn't follow you know local procedures, um, and they basically threw not only threw the case out. They they made uh, the photographer pay uh, twenty thousand dollars to the other side for their legal fees, of which a photographer had to pay ten thousand, and this lawyer was sanctioned ten thousand dollars. This is an extreme case. I, I have not heard. Uh, this is all the same lawyer I'm talking about. He's been sanctioned several times um, by the courts, and the judges have called him a copyright troll in court, which is very unusual to hear from a federal judge. Um, 
but it's um, uh, you got to do your research. You can get burned. What what these lawyers also do, which is what happens. One of the reasons a lawyer like that, and, and there's several like that, will file so many cases is that he's forcing the other side to settle. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking to go to court. Court takes up time. What he's hoping for is a quick settlement. And what happens is you find out later, if you go to a reputable lawyer, that your case could have been worth 30, 50, 75, even $100,000, let's say. Let's say it's, it's worth $30,000. What's going to happen is he's going to settle for two to $5,000 on his case um, because then there's no work for him. So he makes more money. The, he makes more money if he can get quick settlements. And that's what some lawyers do. Um, they look for a quick settlement. Um, and so they file, because when you file a federal lawsuit, that's a very serious thing. The other side has to get a lawyer. They have to answer it properly and, and follow procedures. So um, this lawyer, quite frankly, we think just doesn't have, it seems like he doesn't have the experience because he keeps making the same mistakes over and over again. So this is the way a lawyer can screw up your case is we've seen photographers saying, oh, you know, this was great. I had this picture in fringe and, and my lawyer got me because he's going to take 50 percent, got me fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars. I'm so happy. Two thousand dollars just fell in my lap. And then you find out later from somebody else that they would have settled for fifty thousand dollars. You know, and you would have gotten and they don't charge 50 percent. They're charging a, a lawyer normally uh, in cases like this, except in extreme cases, would charge um, 30 to 35 percent of um, uh, the net amount. So you're talking about um, um, uh, which brings up another good subject I'd love to get into. Um, so you're talking about you're, you're giving up uh, 25 or 30,000 in your pocket uh, or more as opposed to just getting 2000. Now, now, are you happy about that? You know, that's a different story. <laughs> the other thing we talk about too, is they have these search firms that'll do searches on the internet for you. If, if, uh, um, and I'll mention the name of one of them and there, there's several of them and, they, and all of them seem to be based out of Germany. Uh, but there's one called Pixie. Um, now, if you read Pixie's fine, uh, uh, you know, the, the little fine print on their uh, use agreement, if they find an infringement, you have to give them 50% of the settlement. That doesn't count you hiring a lawyer. And they say, well, we'll hire a lawyer for you. We had, there was one case, um, oh, and I, I can't remember the name of the, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the suit, but it made headlines all over social media because the judge ruled that um, the company was able to take this image off the internet and that was fair use. And everybody went absolutely nuts. And Ed and I read the actual court papers and we saw Pixie hired the lawyer. They hired a lawyer who didn't know what he was doing. And the judge even said in his ruling, he can only rule on the facts that are presented in front of him. That's the way a trial goes. And that's why you see sometimes lawyers saying outrageous things in the beginning, because if they don't bring up an argument in the beginning, it's considered abandoned. So if you don't bring that argument up, the judge can't rule on it, even if he knows that the ruling is going to be wrong. That's the way the court system works. The, the lawyers have to argue uh, you know, the facts. And if they don't present it, the judge can't rule on it. Um, and in this case, the judge knew it, it was a BS ruling and it, it went to appeals and um, it was turned over. No big surprise to anybody. But we read the court papers, not the headlines in social media and the stories that were, was being written. And we found out that this was a pixel case, which really upset the judge too, because it turns out that Pixie's um, um, uh, um, terms where they get 50%. The lawyer who stated in court that he gets 35%. That means whatever they would have ended up with. And, and I think in the end, they got like $2,500 $2, judgment, you know, $2,500. The photographer, I, and we don't know if this is what happened, but according to the way all the papers read, he's entitled to 15%, one five. Because 50% goes to Pixie, 35% was going to the uh, lawyer. Now, 
Pixie's terms of use says if you use them and they find it, they get 50%. Even if you hire your own lawyer, they get. So there was somebody in social media, a couple, I forget their name too, who had something uh, a while back saying, oh, you know, they sued and, and they ended up with this tiny amount. And they never said it. And first thing that went through my mind is I said, this was a Pixie case. You know, and Pixie works on the same thing that this this troll lawyer um, that I've been talking about um, uh, does, which is they look for quick settlements. Mm -hmm. They they use their in-house people, which actually is a little illegal because you're supposed to be using lawyers for some of the things that they're doing. They're trying to use in-house people to um, um, uh, get quick settlements from people. And again, wow. you're going to end up with money, but it may not be what you are really entitled to. Well, um, here's on all the years, in all the years you've been a photographer. Um, how many infringements have you dealt with? Me, um, two. Two. Now think think how many years you've been a photographer. So some of these new photographers, it's like they're praying. <coughs> excuse me, that somebody steals their image, and they're going to make millions and millions of dollars on that image, and it's like. That's not going to happen. No, they're, they're making it. You know, they make it sound like once somebody steals one of your images, wow, you're set for life. No, no, and um, litigating is not fun. I, now, Ed, who's a lawyer, um, we did one workshop once. He asked everybody in the room, um, "Has anybody here um, uh, sued anybody and you know, uh, gone to trial uh, for anything?" You know, like three hands go up, and Ed looks at him and said. And did you have fun? No, <laughs> it's not a fun process. Uh, although I will tell you, both of my infringements got me five-figure checks. I mean, it paid for my Prius uh, that I drive uh, in cash. Um, it, it's Yes, you can collect a lot. Um, you, you're not set for life. Um, it, it's, uh, the, it, dep it depends on the case. There are certain cases that are worth a lot because of the way the image was used. Um, and there's, there's cases that aren't worth pursuing. Um, I, I know Ed specifically, if, if it's a small case, he says, it's, you're not going to get anything after you, you know, you pay me, he won't take a case like that. Um, he says, it's, it's not worth it. We've, we've heard of, of some things happening like that, but you need to go somebody who litigates these types of things and knows, um, about the range that a case like that would be worth. Um, and, uh, quite honestly, it takes some research, even from an, uh, an expert. If you walk into a lawyer's office and he tells you, oh, this case is worth uh, $50,000 off the bat like that, turn around and find another lawyer because they really don't know. They have to do some research. Every case is based on its own facts and its own merits. Photographers like to take something they hear and apply it to everything. Uh, and it doesn't work that way um, in, in legal cases. Everything has its own set of facts, and, exactly. and you really have to dive into it. Now, Jack, it's so funny. Um, a few summers ago, <coughs> excuse me, um, I'm trying to think around the time. I, I, remember, I remember it was in the summer because I was in the swimming pool, and I called you and I said, hey, Jack, would you pay $3.5 million? <coughs> excuse me for this photo of the Statue of Liberty. And what it was, was the U.S. Postal Service made a huge mistake. They downloaded a copy of yeah. the Statue of Liberty from Las Vegas and not not from Angeti, um, right. and not the actual Statue of Liberty. And the court found that the artist was entitled to $3.5 million because of the amount of money they made. You know, about the amount of money that the uh, post office made off of that image. Yeah, that um, was that's actual damages. Yes, and, yeah. and I called yeah. you. you know, isn't that, isn't that it's comical? Because I'm, lo I'm looking back at this because you were always my go-to guy. Whenever I saw something funny like this, I yeah. call you, and the first thing you would say is, uh, "Like you just said just now, that's actual damages." Um, yeah. Now if, yeah. It, it's yeah, it, wow. it's. There's, I will tell you, most of the really big cases you did never hear about because they're settled and they're settled um, 
uh, uh, with non-disclosure agreements. So nobody knows what happened. There, there's one case that comes up all the time, which is um, Patrick Carew versus Richard Prince. And it was these pictures of the Rastafarians. And if you read in, in the art magazines, and, and I've had lawyers say this too, um, that, um, uh, well, Richard Prince, you know, won that. Um, and what happened is lower court saw for Patrick Carew, the photographer, um, Judge Bates killed Richard Prince and uh, it, it was going to be a fortune. He appealed to a higher court. The appellate court um, uh, said, no, these images here are transformative. So that's a fair use. And people stop right there. What the court also said was, and these five images are infringements, and it's going back to Judge Bates, uh, Bats, who, who just passed away a few months ago. Judge Bats will now determine the damages. Well, what happened after that is Richard Prince settled with Patrick Carew. We don't know how that ended up. I will take a guess, and I'm going to think that I'm probably right, is that Richard Prince wrote a very large check to Patrick Carew. But if you read this in, in the news stuff, people saying, oh, you know, Richard Prince, you know, got away with this. No, he got away with some of the images and not all of them. In fact, a lot of us wanted to see that case go to the Supreme Court because we didn't understand how the judges were suddenly art critics and were determining which mm. ones were transformative and which ones weren't. There's no clear line on that. And it's a very, very confusing area. And um, uh, because they settled, um, it, it didn't go on to another court. Um, now, that's one of the rare cases where if it did, yes, it would have been hundreds of thousands of dollars to pursue this case. But this case was about millions of dollars. Um, these images um, that Patrick, um, I'm sorry, that Richard Prince reproduced and sold, he was selling for outrageous amounts of money, and it was into the millions of dollars. Um, wow. So, so cases like that happen. But there's other cases that are a lot simpler. I know um, uh, oh, Ed had a, uh, well, he can't talk about the case. Um, cause, and I don't know what happened either, but you know, he's had cases where like a, a famous photographer, uh, who gets a lot of money for fine art, uh, photographs has one of his images put on a dress, uh, from like, uh, H and M or something. And, uh, you know, uh, that, goes into a lot of money because of the way it was used. He's also sued um, a very popular play on Broadway because they use a photographer's photo for the backdrop of the play. It was a bar in Africa that no longer existed. And they use this photographer's picture of this iconic bar. In fact, they used it in other ways, you know, to promote the play. This became like the logo of the play. So you never know how it's being used. It's it's not always on the internet. Um, there's a lot of different types of uh, infringements. Wow. Hey, Jack, you're always a wealth of knowledge. That's why I love talking to you. Now, um, where, where can we find out more about you? <laughs> I'm not telling you, no. Um, <laughs> well, it, it's these types of things. You can go to our blog thecopyrightzone.com one word thecopyrightzone.com and and you can ask us questions there um you can also reach me on my um uh, uh my email uh which is jack at photonews.com and uh ed greenberg also has an email um but you're probably better off asking me first sometimes yeah. <laughs> instead of trying to reach. He's, he's still a busy lawyer. Um, uh, but he also has a, um, a website, uh, ECG law, uh, com, I believe it is. Um, uh, let me just, uh, you know, uh, if you got a second, I will yep. take a quick look, I'll... uh, and make sure I have it. ECG. No, uh, I, I think it's, IP law. Anyway, um, I'm sure you can put it up. Um, but if people try and reach me, that's really the best way. And if they want to see my images, they can go to um, my website, which is resnicki.com, if you can spell my last name correctly, uh, which is R-E-Z-N-I-C-K-I.com. Well, hey, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And like, once again, extremely informative. My pleasure.
and 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 happy shooting to everybody and i hope everybody's getting through these times uh okay and um things move on you got it all right i'll talk to you soon all righty bye-bye you are listening to the in focus interview show if you like these interviews be sure to subscribe to our weekly photo focus podcast on photofocus.com thank you for joining us